Uh, the Night of the Hunter is the cinematic embodiment of the good versus evil parable. And we're indeed fortunate tonight to have as our special guest someone who was on the set of that film working on it while it was being made. She's been performing in films and television since her age was in single digits, most notably as Sissy in Family Affair. She is also the author of three books with more to come, so would you please give a warm welcome to tonight's special guest, Kathy Garber. So what memories were, Jock, how long had it been since you, you'd seen uh, Night of the Hunter, and uh, what, what exactly did you do? Because I didn't really explain that in my introduction. Well, I actually saw it in December when I was uh, at the Film Noir up in San Francisco at right. the Castro, and uh, I hadn't seen it for a while. I remember, my son is 28 now, I, <laughs> uh, I had him rather late in life, but when he was 12, I wanted to show him Night of the Hunter, and it had just come out on DVD. So I had seen it before, but I thought he would enjoy it. And so uh, the next morning, after he had seen it that evening, I said, well, honey, how did you like um, the movie? And he says, oh, I loved it, Mom. Look, L-O-V-E, H-A-G-E. <laughs> well, whoops. <laughs> Maybe that wasn't the appropriate yeah, I, film to show my 12-year-old. Yeah, I, I don't think Mitchum was really the role model no. <laughs> that you were looking. He was diabolical. Oh, really he was, was very scary. And you asked um, how I was involved in the movie. Sure. Well, my aunt, um, my aunt Florence, my brother is in the audience that knows Aunt Florence very well. He lives in Palm Desert. Um, but she had uh, gone to RKO because mm -hmm. she had a couple sons in the business. And she told my mom that they were looking for a double for Sally Jane. Now you have to understand, this little girl was only five years old, and um, she couldn't do a lot of the scenes. Right. And especially the ones in the skiff, that was primarily me. So they were looking for a double for Sally Jane. Right. So we went over to RKO, and I met Charles Lawton. He was very... Um, picky on every single thing. This was, as we know, the very first uh, movie that he had ever directed, yeah. and he was into every aspect of it. Mm -hmm. So I met him, and so the first thing he said, after we had chatted a bit, he said, run down the street. And having big brothers and um, being very competitive and athletic, I ran as fast as I could. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, that was a very fast run. He said, but now, because I was eight years old, I was three years older than Sally, but little, I'm still not that tall. And <laughs> so he said, now run as a six-year-old might run, a five-year-old. Mm -hmm. And so I ran a little more awkwardly, and he said, okay, you're hired. So hey. <laughs> that's, that's how I got to be the double, and then I was on you know, this set all the way through the movies, whereas we lost a couple people when Shelly Winters died and she was only in the front part and then we lost uh, Mr. Gleason who was, I mean, was that not a fabulous cast? I mean, every right. single person, yes. Yeah. Shelly Winters and Lillian Gish, it was really wonderful yeah, I, to work I, with all those people. I think Lawton, uh, one of the, the films that he ran in kind of getting himself together were all of Griffith's films. He really admired Griffith, so the transition to asking Miss Gish to be in the film was, was really a natural. And um, for those of you, uh, you had mentioned the DVD. Uh, this film came out on Blu-ray, I think by Criterion, some years ago. And one of the fascinating things is, is as Lawton was directing the film, there was a camera crew filming him directing the film. And when Lawton passed away, those went to his widow, Elsa Lanchester. And when she passed, in turn, she donated him to the UCLA Film and Television Archive. And Bob Gitt, the restorationist there, long story short, the film of Lawton directing this is intact, and it's an extra on this thing. And I was so impressed by the way he worked with Billy Chapin and the little girl, because he didn't really treat them like little kids, but he didn't quite treat them as adults. Uh, 
What was your impression of, of how Lawton worked with, with the actors? Uh, it seemed to me to be very impressive on, on how he did it. Well, I have read that um, he didn't particularly like the kids, yeah. and, and, and for Sally Jane, because she was just, you well, know, she was too young. She was too young, yeah, yeah. and when she was hired, you mm -hmm. know, it, it was like he liked that aspect of her because she was kind of like wooden and owl-eyed and didn't yeah, understand right. what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny you should say UCLA, which is my alma mater. I mean, sometimes in life, don't you think that there are certain things that happen and that are all tied together and you wonder why? Well, I went to UCLA, as mm -hmm. I said, and I have heard that this documentary is absolutely, it's, really, it's really wonderful. And then again, my brother and I bought a house in Hollywood, mm -hmm. and it happened to be on Curson. Avenue in Hollywood, which is right in between like Sunset and, right. and Hollywood Boulevards, mm -hmm. if anyone knows that area. Well, it just happened that I found out uh, when I was writing my book, Surviving Sissy, and I have a whole big chapter mm -hmm. devoted to the Night of the Hunter, that that's where Charles Lawton lived with Elsa Lancaster. Oh, and yes. I said, well, like, you know, okay, mm -hmm. they abide, we abide, and we <laughs> learn. <laughs> that's one of the wonderful things I think about the movie. Did you have any experience or any interface with Mitchum? while he was on the movie at all? Oh, share, yeah. Please share that with us. <laughs> well, he was really kind of scary. <laughs> to tell you the truth. I mean, he was six foot one and, and very big. And my very first day on the set mm -hmm. is when we're in the cellar and I, um, pretending that I am Sally Jane and we're, we're hiding uh, behind the, the coal cellar. Mm -hmm. So, in comes this man, and all of these glass jars tumble through the floor, and he's chasing us, and, and Billy Chapin is leading me up the steps, mm -hmm. and he was really believable in true mm -hmm. life, and he was really living that part, and that was, that was my first encounter, my first day ever on a, a movie set, right. with Robert Mitchum chasing us, with, <laughs> and, and getting his hand cut. So, yeah, yeah he was uh, scary. Now, off, off the set, you know, when he was sitting in his chair, mm -hmm. he would go off to the trailer and, and the, what everyone was saying on the set, and nip a few. Um, yes. <laughs> and yes. Sometimes he wasn't exactly sober on the set, yes. but he was, he was scary in many ways. Well, he, well uh, Mitchum uh, w was such a pro. There is a story that Paul Gregory told about one day where he filmed, and I believe you were sh they were shooting the exteriors out at Roland Lee's old ranch out in the valley. In Canoga Park, In Canoga right. Park, yeah, at the end of Roscoe Boulevard. And uh, he showed up and he couldn't work and um, he and Gregory had some sort of discussion and it ended up with Bob feeling a call to nature on Paul Gregory's new car. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I, I think uh, Mitchum really believed in the part that he was playing, the whole uh, 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 prophesizing in a phony way about religion and being really diabolical. And he and Lawton really got along really well. In fact, uh, fast forwarding to advising consent, which was Lawton's last picture in 62. At this point, Mitchum, I think, was living on the East Coast, had, was raising horses. And uh, Lawton went there to study with him on a southern, certain southern accent to play a southern southern. So they were an odd but very close couple, very close couple, yeah. So uh, as far as uh, any other recollections of your time on the set with Lawton, Mitchum, any of the principals, anything else that you remember? I mean, eight years old was a long time ago. It was, I mean, at least 10 years. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Oh, excuse me. Um, yeah, but I was past the age of reason because I was eight and sure. I was a little precocious. And mm -hmm. uh, I do remember many, many things. And like, and Lillian Gish was such a lovely, gracious person. I, I have this great picture of um, Lillian Gish and Charles Lawton and myself and Billy Chapin, Cheryl Calloway and uh, Mary Jane Clemens. They right. were part of the, the children at the end. And we are all standing around this big table that is replete with salami and cheese and crackers and, and uh, Lillian Gish is starting. <laughs> yeah. And 
Lillian Gish is the one that supplied that herself, spent her own money, um, and supplied the whole cast and crew because mm -hmm. she thought, well, that was her gift to us. Mm -hmm. And she gifted us with so many things besides her talent and mm -hmm. her graciousness. Food, which is always a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, from this, um, I'm trying to go a little chronologically, there was the Ten Commandments. So you went from Charles Lawton, and by the way, a poor Charles Lawton, a little empathy, because this not only was his first film that he directed, it was his last, because when this film came out, the critics really didn't know uh, how, how good it was and what to make of it, and it, it was not successful commercially, and uh, I think Paul Gregory called Charles Lawton a stadium of nerves. Mm. And so when the film wasn't successful, Lawton didn't direct any more films, which I think was our loss as well as his. But you ended up in the Ten Commandments with C.B. DeMille and, and Heston and all of that. How did that. How did that work for you? How did you get that part? Well, that was interesting because I went from horror to holiness. Uh, in that's, a a, that's the title of a book, you know, yeah. Horror to Holiness. Yeah. Yeah, 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 maybe I'll make that my fifth book. Yeah, there you go. Write. Um, I was just hired as an extra mm -hmm. on uh, the Ten Commandments, and I was in this wagon during the mm -hmm. Exodus scene, and all of a sudden I heard this big voice cry out, Don't let that little girl's face get in the camera! And I said, Who is that? I said, is that God? <laughs> well, we were Same filming. <laughs> yeah, we were filming this at the Ten Commandments. He was, I guess, a cinematic mm -hmm. deity. Mm -hmm. But uh, after that particular scene was over, he, uh, I got down off the wagon mm -hmm. and we chatted. Mm -hmm. And he. This is you and Demille. Uh, yeah, Demille and I. Well, he was on a great big crane. That's why I thought. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's God. And he descended on this crane, mm -hmm. and so he came over and. Uh, so we chatted, and then he had scenes written into the movie with Charlton Heston and mm -hmm. myself. Wow. I mean, I, I was in um, that, that famous scene, the, the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. It's a story, but it takes maybe three minutes, so I won't well, uh, tell. I, I, indulge us. We're, you're, you're, you're here. I'm sure everyone wants well, to hear about the parting of the Red Sea. And okay, you. Which was done with Jell-O and also <laughs> on, on Paramount. Well, mm -hmm. Okay, so here you have this very famous director, and he's shooting these great big epics. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons I think that he picked, he picked people out to mm -hmm. help the humanity. Mm -hmm. Well, when he's shooting these great big scenes, he wants to have three cameras to shoot everything. So he'll have the one that will, you know, get the main scene, mm -hmm. and then he would get another camera to get mm -hmm. another angle. Now, this is the closing of the Red Sea, which is very important. So he thought, Keep just in case, <laughs> yeah, just in case, yeah. he better get a third camera. So he put a third camera way back up on the catwalk. Mm -hmm. Now, there were big catwalks. We were at, at Paramount with all these big bats of water. Mm -hmm. So finally, everything was set up. This took like two days. Mm -hmm. And like <laughs> my story is taking, no, <laughs> it, take, it took about two days. So then all the extras were ready mm -hmm. and the oxen and the camels. And mm -hmm. I was to go on my perch on the uh, paper mache mountain mm -hmm. from one place up into the <laughs> arms of Nina Bosch. Yeah. So he yells, action. And uh, all the camels and the oxen go through. I climb up into my perch. All the vats of water come down. Yeah. It was great. <laughs> and he says, perfect, cut. And so he says, camera number one, how was it for you? And the cameraman said, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. DeMille. A camel walked in front of us and I missed the shot. <laughs> you missed the shot. I am so sorry, Mr. DeMille. Mm -hmm. OK. Camera number two. How is it for you? Oh, Mr. DeMille, I am I'm so sorry. Water splashed in the lens, and I lost the shot. You lost the shot. And he says, I am so sorry, Mr. DeMille. Well, now, at this point, Mr. DeMille is not really a happy director. Yeah. And then he remembered the little guy way back up on the catwalk. So he says, camera number three, how was it for you? And the cameraman yelled back, Ready when you are, CB! <laughs> that 
that's a true story. I was there. <laughs> that's but. great. That's great. Now you said you went from horror to holiness. Now, was the was the bad seed before, or was that before or after Ten Commandments? I think it was before, wasn't it? No, it was af after. It was af after Ten Commandments. After Ten Commandments. Yes. And. Uh, Patty, we had Patty McCormick here some years ago, who's a doll for the Bad Seed. Uh, what what did you do on that film? What was your experience on that? Well, we shot um, at Griffith Park, and with Shelley Fabre mm -hmm. and myself and Patty, and those of you who have seen the Bad Seed, mm -hmm. um, I I what my lines were to say, oh well, you were really bad, and you know we we saw you with mm -hmm. the the fellow that was killed and mm -hmm. all of that, and we're not going to play with you, mm -hmm. and so that was the scene which was left on the cutting room floor. <laughs> but I've got some great pictures of it. That's great. And, and my mom, don't you love stage moms? She says, well, you know why that they cut you out of that film? Why not? You were so much better than Patty. <laughs> I said, thank you, mom. <laughs> it's Mother's Day. Yeah, that's yeah. right, Mother's mom. Day weekend. Yeah. Uh, you know, you just talked about your mom, stage mom. You know, you hear all of the horror stories of some of your contemporaries and child actors and all that. What was that experience like for you starting out at eight years old and your, your mom had to be on the set. I think they had to have a social worker on the set and it was governed. But looking back at that experience of, of growing up around C.B. DeMille and Charles Lawton, uh, uh, was your, would, did your mother push you into that or was it a natural progression? Au contraire. She, <laughs> my mother, maybe this is her Swiss-Austrian thing, we've done that DNA test, but she really wanted me, she was very practical, mm -hmm. and so when I was taken out of school to go do something, mm -hmm. she said, now don't tell anybody where you were, you know, just, just tell them you were out. So everything was pushed down, mm -hmm. and she wanted me, I think, to be as normal as possible. Mm -hmm. And so it was never, she was never, never pushy. And I've actually had to work against that, you know, and said, well, now I should really sing my praises a little bit more instead mm -hmm. of being as level-headed as I am right now. <laughs> you know, but um, it, she wasn't pushy at all. Mm -hmm. But I, I wrote, my third book was Ex-Child Stars, Where Are They Now? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, there have been so many child stars that have suffered from a stage mother, the little girl, unfortunately, that was on my TV series, you know, who died at 18. I mean, uh, how tragic is that? Mm -hmm. um, from a drug overdose. And mm -hmm. uh, some mothers, you know, just push their kids, and the kids don't understand. They have a lot of mm -hmm. accolades, and, and well, I'm just at the top of the heap, and then you fall off the mm -hmm. heap, and nobody's really there to pick you up. Yeah, I remember Jackie Cooper telling me about um, his uncle directing him way back when, uh, I think it was uh, Norman McLeod, I can't come up with the name of the director, but he was actually Jackie's uncle and Jackie had to cry and so he told him, your, your dog just died. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I mean, stu and, and apparently stuff like that was rather routine to get an effect out of a child uh, of a certain age. Did you run into any of that at all? Or? I, I actually did. Um, now, this was in my second book, but um, I was doing, I was um, semi-regular in a television uh, show called This Is Alice mm -hmm. uh, with Patty Garrity, uh, et cetera. Uh, and I remember, my name was Sally, and I remember the director, and I was leaving town, and he says, now you have to cry. And I said, oh, okay, he says, you're a horrible actress, you can't cry, you're just awful, you're not a good actress at all, you can't cry, kid. <laughs> because he was making me cry, because he was telling me I was so awful. You know, so that, that, does, that did run through it. Right. We have different issues now. Mm -hmm. you know, with social media and drugs and everything for the kids and right. other, you mm -hmm. know, abuses of, mm -hmm. of child, mm -hmm. children, but. Mm -hmm. So as your career went along and you, uh, you know, you did, you did a lot of television, I think anyone of a certain age, certainly my age, remembers Family Affair with Sissy here. And uh, uh, absolutely. And, and I have to ask you, was Sebastian Cabot as nice and as avuncular as he was on that show? Um, no, but Brian Keith was. Uh, <laughs> 
How did how did you get the part of Family Affair, and what what the, what was that experience like being on that show for which ran for what six years, I believe? Five, but Five it's years. actually never been off, and you know, and it's still oh, on like decades. Me, me and, TV, nothing's yeah, ever right. off. Yeah, you know, that's, that's Perry right. Mason's on twice a day. Sure. You know, if you have your TV on, you live with Raymond Burr and Bill Tallman all the time. What was the Family Affair experience like for you? Well, I was I was going to UCLA, and uh, I got a call from my mom. I was with Hazel McMillan, was my agent, Gloria McMillan's mom. Mm -hmm. uh, and they said, and she said, well, uh, honey, you, you have an interview for a new series that already sold it, and they need the teenage girl, but you have to have brown hair, I mean, blonde, blonde hair and blue eyes. Now, at that time, I had brown hair. I didn't have blonde hair now. <laughs> and, uh, and you have to be at, in Hollywood uh, at like 3 o'clock. And I was in Westwood. She says, I'll come and pick you up. This is my mom talking. Mm -hmm. And I says, but mom, I have brown hair. She says, I've got this all solved. Yeah. So she brings over a, a can of streaks and tips. Any of you ladies or gentlemen remember in the 60s, they have the stuff that you spray on your hair and it instantly turns it a different color. Well, mine was supposed to be blonde, but it turned out that it was gold. I felt like something out of Goldfinger. <laughs> it was like a, the steel helmet. She says, come on, come on, we've got to go. Mm -hmm. So I go in, I'm talking to Ed Hartman, who is the producer. This is, this is the low-key, unassuming mom you just told us about, right? <laughs> yes. Well, she can be tough when she wanted. Yeah. She's a Taurus. <laughs> okay. And so um, she wanted to help. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there chatting with the, mm -hmm. the director and, and the, the producer. And uh, Edmund Hartman turns to me and he says, What's wrong with your hair? <laughs> I said, my hair? And he says, yes, it's turning green. <laughs> I said, oh, I don't know, it must be the light. <laughs> but uh, it got us chatting, and uh, mm -hmm. so then I did a screen test. Um, I was mm -hmm. right on, they were shooting the pilot already. Mm -hmm. I got this long blonde wig from Max Factor in this like blue and white check dress mm -hmm. that looked like Alice in Wonderland. Mm -hmm. And I did the screen test, and then my agent called me, back at the sorority, and she says, okay, you have got the part, with a certain caveat, you can never wear that wig, nor never wear that dress again. <laughs> I said, no problem. <laughs> so that went on for five years, and it's still running. All right. All right. Uh, you mentioned Brian Keith, a terrific actor, and uh, sounds like a lovely guy. He was a very interesting fellow. He um, he was a macho man. He was a macho man with a really tender and sensitive heart. He loved kids, but if he didn't like an adult and someone that was on the the set, mm -hmm. he would let them know. Mm -hmm. And he had his ups and downs while we were shooting. Mm -hmm. um, he was married and then got divorced and then uh, had uh, got married again. But he was very, very entertaining. I learned a lot from him. The thing with Family Affair, you mentioned uh, Sebastian Cabot, who it was, it was difficult for him to learn lines, but he would learn them word for word and go over them during the weekends. And um, on the set, he would go with a dialogue coach. Mm -hmm. Brian, on the other hand, would come in and say, OK, what are we doing today? And he'd look at the, the script and say, oh, Let's that was it. that was how th there are several actors like that like Mitchum, Mickey Rooney, Dana Andrews that could, you know, Mitchum would come in and say, "What are the lyrics?" <laughs> you know, and look at him and he would know them. But I guess Cabot had to really work at it. Oh, he re he really did. Yeah. But it made a nice dynamic between them. Mm -hmm. You know, so you had this you know laid back and, and if Brian didn't like a particular one, you just want to like that. <laughs> okay, yes, Uncle Bill, I, I'll go. Mm -hmm. And then Sebastian then mm -hmm. would say each one of his lines. I was surprised that Robert Mitchum um, sang and was a poet and, and wrote songs. Oh, he did. I have, a, I have a record at home, and he did a Calypso record uh, when he was there. And, and it, it's really, I mean, you laugh, uh, but it's really not bad. And uh, he, he was a poet. He was uh, uh, self-made. Uh, really, really smart, and uh, uh, he gave the impression that he didn't care about acting and, and BS and so on and so forth. And he was in, I think, uh, one movie with Howard Hawks, and Hal Hawks finally went up to him and said, you know, you old so-and-so, uh, he says, you, you give everyone the impression you don't give a shit about your work, but you do. And Mitchum said, don't tell anybody. 
<laughs> because he was really a tough guy. You know, he was on a chain gang. Oh, and yeah. he was a oh, big yeah. and went all, all the way through. Well, I was asking Cindy mm-hmm. uh, Mitchum, that's all, you know, about telling her. I was so surprised that mm-hmm. Robert Mitchum, you know, was such a boy. He says, well, that's because we're Norwegian. <laughs> oh, <laughs> all okay. all lords, you know, okay. when they're young and, and guys mm-hmm. even write poetry. Mm-hmm. So he had this lyrical quality about them. So even though he was this tough guy, mm-hmm. again, he had the sensitivity. That was the same with Brian Keith, who was a Marine mm-hmm. and a champion fighter, mm-hmm. but had the sensitive, fabulous yeah. soul. Yeah, and I really liked the, the going back to the Night of the Hunter. I really liked the kind of lyrical wind of the willows quality that that Lawton gave the picture when they're in the canoe and the frog and the rabbits and all of that and he really wanted to show a lot of what was going on from the children's perspective and I think Gregory at one point said why do you need to do this thing with a spider web with strings and they put honey on it and 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 so forth and Lawton says because that's the way I want to tell the story and and that I think it gives that movie that kind of special quality uh, that, that it has and holds up. Uh, now, you're doing a lot of not only acting, but, and you're writing your books, but voiceover work. Ah. How did you make that, how, was that an easy transition for being a voiceover performer from being a, a, you know, an actress on television and so forth? Well, I remember when I was in Hollywood and my agent says, we have a voiceover interview for you. And I said, what's that mean? What's a voiceover? Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, well, just go on and and they'll tell you. Mm -hmm. And so it was like the tuna fish. Mm -hmm. And I had to say, I like tuna fish. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went on the interview and he says, Mm -hmm. oh, this is easy. I like tuna fish. And he says, well, okay, say it a different way. Oh, I like tuna fish. He said, no, a different way. I like tuna fish. (laughs) He said, okay, thank you very much. So I didn't understand that there are very many different kinds of voices that you have. You could have a deep voice or a high voice or a sexy voice or any kinds of different voices. So he was looking for a different kind of thing. Well, I was so ashamed that I couldn't give him, like any other voices, that I took lessons. Mm -hmm. You know, what a concept. Mm -hmm. So I took lessons, studied with Mel Wells. I was a speech major in college anyway. I know you can't tell because I don't talk very much, right? Um, I was was gonna say they really had to drag it out of you. (laughs) Pull those words out. so I then I I love voiceover. I I've done like five animated series. I was fire star on Spider Man and his amazing friends and Dixie and Dixie's Donna and Pepper and just all kind of done like eighty audiobooks, which I really do you want he listen to audiobooks, aren't they wonderful? Anyway, yeah, I love audiobooks. Great to drive to. Yeah. Now you've written three books and tell us about tell us your, your transition into the the, the writing field. How did that work for you? Well, when you're an actor, you know, you just, it's not like having a nine to five job, or it's not like having, you know, I'm an architect, and so, well, I finished this house, and I'm going out to that house. Mm-hmm. You know, you get a job, you lose a job. I mean, that's like number one. The phone one rings, the, the phone doesn't ring. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, like number one on the angst. Right. List also, mm-hmm. so I I have a lot of energy and I really <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah I do. <laughs> so you know you do uh, mm-hmm. a movie and I said well now what's next? Mm-hmm. And so I found that I can have this sixty plus year career mm-hmm. by well if I'm not doing uh, a stage play. Um, then I will write a book. If I'm not writing a book, then what film you know is next? Um, so I really kind of embraced all of the the tenets of the entertainment field, mm-hmm. and that's what stood me in good or sat me in good uh, stead. Okay. Now, uh, one book is biographical. One book is the one about uh, child stars that you have known and, and what has happened to them. And then I understand one is a cookbook. Yeah, that was my first book. Oh, okay. You were like kind of putting your toe out there in the water. Right, the yeah, let's yeah. see how that works. Yeah. Um, I like uh, food and I, I like to uh, eat and uh, like to cook, so I just whipped that all together and Mm -hmm. came out with that that first book. I had been working on my memoir, as we all do, you know, or many of us Mm -hmm. do, 
for you know years, and then unfortunately we had a fire in our house. Ooh. So, but it was all up here. So, and I got a two book deal with a publisher. That nothing gets you off your mm -hmm. and and gets your writing like a um, deadline. A deadline. Because <laughs> yes. you're dead if you don't meet that line. Right. So I uh, mm -hmm. that I, I wrote then finally my my memoir. Then as you say, the ex child star. And so May nineteenth, which is my mother's birthday, comes my fourth book, which is Holiday Recipes for a Family Affair. Right. Nothing like right. milking it. But. And you have your yeah you have your table out there and you will be out there and we're we're going to have our reception now as the hour grows late but Kathy I really want to thank you for coming you have made the 20th anniversary opening night really really special with Night of the Hunter so put it together for Kathy Garber.